Yeah, 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 you little rodent. Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous fall morning here in the end times. It is finally feeling like fall here in the Santa Cruz Mountains here on Wednesday morning, November 4th, 2015. And I really don't have time for a rant today, but I can't drive and drink my coffee anyway. So uh, you get a kind of an extra bonus Kind of an extra bonus doomsday sermon rant. I already brought this book out last week by Thomas L. Friedman. Hot, flat, and crowded about um, what's going on on this planet. Now, I was kind of surprised at the, the absolute vitriol I got about Thomas Friedman when I came out with my last rant. Uh, Kind of like whenever I defend Al Gore. Guys, I, I understand that Thomas Friedman is, is a hypocrite. I, I, I mean, just, just a grotesque hypocrite. I understand this. I understand that Thomas L. Friedman uh, probably has the carbon ecological footprint oh, of about equal to Uganda's footprint. The guy is, is a complete planet-consuming maniac, but that does not mean that he, just because he is an unbelievable hypocrite who does not practice one word of which he preaches, uh, be that as it may, he still understands that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I, I mean, Adolf Hitler knew that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Just because someone is, is a goddamn hypocrite or evil or whatever, that, that doesn't mean that they can't understand what is going on on this planet. Now, Thomas Friedman, as much as anyone that, that I've ever come across, understands what's going on on this planet, and he's a damn good writer. He's won two Pulitzer Prizes. He is able to articulate what is going on on this planet and while we are screwed as well as anybody as I've ever met. And so particularly if you're just starting down this road figuring out what is going on on this planet and why we are so screwed, I highly recommend the first half of this book. The second half of this book, he, he completely goes off into La La Land. I don't know what kind of mushroom he eats uh, halfway through this book. I'm thinking of how a few windmills and solar panels are going to save this planet. But before he does uh, go off into La La Land, he, he spells it out. And this is his chapter on, uh, on biodiversity. The Age of Noah talking about uh, the, the sixth mass extinction and, and what is happening at least to every other earthling we share this planet with. And he starts out in one of the great biodiversity hotspots on planet Earth that you've probably never heard of, and that is the Pantanal region. The Pantanal, just south of the Amazon rainforest, this giant uh, wetland. Imagine the, the Everglades the size of Wisconsin, and you've got some idea. A lot more biodiverse in a lot of ways than the Amazon jungle. And he uses it as an absolute clear-cut example what is going on in the Pantanal today as a perfect microcosm of what is going on on this planet. And so I'm going to uh, read uh, section 3, verse 3 from chapter 6, I believe, The Age of Noah. And we're going to be start out there in the Pantanal. <clears throat> The broad threat to biodiversity and ecosystems worldwide today comes from two directions. The first is from regions where the poorest of the poor, we are talking about planet nibblers, 
okay? I had a rant about planet nibbling a couple of days. Not even Jared Diamond understands planet nibbling. Let Thomas Friedman, Thomas Friedman, uh, explain planet nibbling to you. Okay, this is the first of the broad threats to diversity is from regions where the poorest of the poor are trying to scrape out a living from the natural ecosystems around them. When too many people, when too many poorest of the poor people try to do that, you lose whatever forests, reefs, and species are within their reach. It has nothing to do with globalization at this point. This is localized planet eating. It is every bit as effective as globalized, some ways even more effective, in, in eating a planet. That is a huge problem around the Amazon wetlands and rainforest, but not so much in the Pantanal. The Pantanal is not threatened uh, at this point by poor residents who chop down the trees and sell them to timber companies to escape from poverty. The culture in the Pantanal is a rare example of man and nature thriving in harmony through a mixed economy of ranching, fishing, and lately ecotourism. I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to hit the, uh, the bullshit detector button. But what he's talking about, that is large landowners who own huge ranches is, is what it is. Okay, so we leave the planet nibblers and now he explains planet eating. <clears throat> no, the main biodiversity challenge to the Pantanal comes from the outside, from globalization, a global th triple threat. He keeps talking in the past tense, was converging on the Pantanal. It is converging on the Pantanal, uh, Thomas. Soy farmers on the plateau above the Pantanal Basin, eager to feed a rapidly expanding world soybean market, were widening their fields and pesticides and silt runoff from their farms were fouling the rivers and wildlife inside the Pantanal. At the same time, the governments, the governments, completely in the pockets of the multinational corporations. The New World Order. At the same time, the governments of Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia had formed a trading block in the hope of making their economies more globally competitive to better get to the Pantanal soy products to market, these governments wanted to dredge and straighten the rivers in the area in ways that could greatly alter the ecosystem. Finally, well finally, uh, and also a consortium of international energy companies, a consortium of international energy companies was building a pipeline across the Pantanal from natural gas rich Bolivia to the vast energy guzzling Brazilian city of Sao Paulo. The Pantanal in fact is a laboratory of globalization's economic upsides and biodiversity downsides. <clears throat> the biggest upside is that globalization is bringing more people out of poverty faster than ever before in the history of the world. That is an upside if you are a planet nibbler wanting to become a planet eater. That is the upside. Then we got the flip side. 
The biggest downside is that in raising standards of living, globalization, the new world order, I'm studying this word, the new world order in here, <clears throat> globalization is making possible much higher levels of both production and consumption by many more people. That is flat meeting crowded on the planet. And that, in turn, is fueling urban sprawl around the world. <clears throat> An increase in highways and motorized traffic and bigger homes with more energy-guzzling devices for more people. Uh, thank you, Pukalo, for sending me a picture of Thomas Friedman's home. Uh, Thomas Friedman, more than anybody on the planet, knows about motorized traffic and bigger homes with more energy-guzzling devices for more people. To feed uh, Thomas uh, Friedman's fat mouth and this ravenous global economy, more and more companies are tempted to take over vast native forests in places like Indonesia and Brazil and convert them to oil palm plantations. Soybean farms and other large-scale commercial enterprises at a speed and scope the world has never seen before. Over the year, uh, Glenn Prickett, I think Glenn is from Conservation International, explains, uh, yeah, non-government organizations like Conservation International, the Nature, Cons Nature Conservancy, and the World Wildlife Fund have developed tools and large-scale education campaigns that can help the rural poor live more sustainably and preserve the very natural systems on which they depend. I, I, I'm sure these, uh, the, these Goddards in uh, Uganda spend most of their time coming home to their mud huts at night reading Audubon magazine. I'm sure that, that's the top of their list. Anyway, quoting uh, Glenn Prigget from the Conservation International, quote, But we have not yet developed the tools and scale of operation to meet the globalization threat to biodiversity, which is becoming overwhelming, he explained. Uh, I, I love this. To be sure, to be sure, in recent years we have seen many collaborations between conservation groups and global companies like Walmart, Starbucks, and McDonald's which aim to show these companies how to reduce the impact their supply chains and manufacturing processes have on the natural world. As he mentions in the next sentence, but all of their efforts, all of the efforts uh, of these mainstream limp dick environmental organizations teaming up with Walmart and McDonald's all of their efforts are just fingers in the dike. Global growth is driving up commodity prices, prompting companies to put more land under agricultural cultivation for food, fiber, and biofuels, and, si and stimulating demand for more tropical forests to be stripped of timber, more coral reefs to be lost to destructive fishing practices, and more mines to be dug for more minerals, such as the 2,000 uh, silver dollars that your old eco-hypocrite has to protect himself from the end times. <clears throat> Without governments that are highly attentive to where and how their lands are developed and able to restrain the pressures from the global marketplace, it, 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 yeah, they, they, they are, the governments are the lap dogs of the global marketplace. The last thing on any government's mind on this planet, with the possible exception of some low-lying island nations in the Pacific Ocean, 
it is to increase the global marketplace. The growth, so without governments uh, doing anything about it, the growth pressures from a world getting flat and crowded at the same time could simply overwhelm the world's last remaining biodiversity rich forests and reefs which will only make the world hotter because deforestation accounts for some 20 percent of all co2 emissions in the same 20 minutes that this rant will take that in the same 20 minutes that we will see some unique species vanish forever, Conservation International notes, 1,200 acres of forest will be burned down and cleared for development. The CO2 emissions from deforestation are greater than the emissions from the world's entire transportation sector. All the cars, trucks, planes, trains, and ships combined and less forest cover means fewer acres of habitat for species so they must move or adapt those that can survive those that cannot go extinct it is that simple only it is now happening faster than ever in more places than ever this is why we need a strong ethic of conservation yeah uh, uh, I'm not going to start talking about uh, this guy's mansion again. There have to be limits on how much and where we encroach on the natural world. Without such limits, we will see the living and nesting areas of more and more species paved over, rivers fouled, corals bleached, and forests plowed under for industrial agriculture. We will continue to lurch from single issue response to single issue response without ever developing a systematic approach that can marry global growth and biodiversity protection. It starts with connecting the dots. <clears throat> All right, let, let's let Thomas Friedman connect some of the dots for us. All right, this is one example. To help cut emissions and boost energy security, the entire U European Union has set the target of producing 20% of its energy from renewable sources by 2020, including increased use of biofuels. This is a major part of how the, the European Union is saving the planet is by ramping up biofuels, which are transportation fuels derived either from crops such as corn, can you say Monsanto, oil palm, soybeans, algae or sugar cane, or from plant waste, wood chips, or wild grasses. The, U, the EU has declared that the, quote, bio ingredients of the biofuels sold in Europe, palm oil and corn, for example, must not come from tropical forests, nature reserves, wetlands, or grasslands with high biodiversity. Please tell me where palm oil comes from if it doesn't come from tropical forests. But fuels are fungible in a world market and not always easy to monitor. It is hard to believe that the EU mandate about renewable fuels will not accelerate the conversion of rainforests in Southeast Asia to oil palm plantations. Some say it already has. Gee, do you think so? Palm oil is the most efficient base for biodiesel fuel, although it is also used for cosmetics and, uh, and in cooking. The cruel irony is that deforestation, it, it is that that deforestation, turn, you know, taking down the jungle to turn into oil palm to make biofuels to cut down on CO2 emissions from cars, the cruel irony is that that deforestation will result 
in more greenhouse gases being released into the atmosphere than the use of the biofuels will eliminate. I have flown over an oil palm plantation in North Sumatra in Indonesia. It looked like someone laid down 25 football fields in the middle of a tropical forest. And then he quotes this uh, guy, Michael Grunewald, writing for Time Magazine in 2008, uh, describing flying over an oil palm plantation in Brazil. Not sure if this was oil palm or soybean. From his Cessna, about a mile above the southern Amazon, John Carter looks down on the destruction of the world's greatest ecological jewel. He watches men converting rainforest into cattle pastures and soybean fields with bulldozers and chains. He sees fires wiping out such gigantic swaths of jungle that scientists now debate the savannization of the Amazon. Brazil, this was in 2008, just announced that deforestation is on track to double this year. And anyone believing that horseshit, that deforestation is dropping in Brazil, pull your head out of your ass. Listen to Time Magazine, for God's sake. Carter, a Texas cowboy with all the subtlety of a chainsaw, says it is going to get worse fast. Quote, it gives me goosebumps, says Carter, who founded a nonprofit to promote sustainable ranching on the Amazon frontier. It is like witnessing a rape. You cannot protect it. There is too much money to be made tearing it down. Out here on the frontier, you really see the market at work. And of course, Thomas Friedman, as far as I know, he's a huge defender of the free market. You know, I don't know, Thomas, you need to, uh, what the hell, uh, you're smoking. The numbers tell the story. <clears throat> Our planet is 4 billion years old and life has existed on Earth for a little more than 2 billion years. Over those 2 billion years, there has been a very, very slow, normal pace of extinction. On average, a species might live for 1 million years, then go extinct. That very gentle, very slow background rate of extinction has been punctuated over the centuries by five massive catastrophic extinction events that have led the loss of an extremely high proportion of our planet's life at different periods. The most recent mass extinction, said Thomas Brooks, the Conservation International Biodiversity Expert, was about 65 million years ago, uh, you know, from that, uh, that asteroid. <clears throat> when one looks at more recent history, the last tens of thousands of years that humans have been on Earth, one finds localized, wide-scale extinctions as human groups move from place to place from the Polynesians in Hawaii, to Indonesian seafarers on Madagascar, to our Pleistocene prede predecessors who walked across the land bridge that existed in what is now in the Bering Strait 12,000 years ago and promptly wiped out many of the large mammals of North America, including the woolly mammoth and saber-toothed tigers. And as we enter the modern age, though, the impact of globalization is metastasizing to cause what is already being called the Earth's sixth great mass extinction. This is not a local extinction event anymore. Quoting uh, this Brooks guy, 
it is unfolding at a scale equal to the asteroid or the impacts of the rest of our planet's five mass extinctions as best as we can measure from the fossil record, Brooks said. We are the flood. We are the asteroid. We had better learn how to be the ark. For more than 40 years now, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has tracked the status of the world's biodiversity and assessed the probability of extinction of every known plant and animal species. Its red list of threatened species monitors current extinctions and gives us a picture of what is happening right now. What we learn from the IUCN Red List is that when mass human-driven extinctions happened in places like the Hawaiian Islands after the arrival of the Polynesians, they were closed system extinctions. Terrible in themselves, but confined to those region, regions, said Brooks, but due to globalization, we are now seeing extinctions that used to be isolated to one island or regioning happening all over the world at the same time. We know that we can restore natural habitat, said Brooks. We know that we can restore populations in order to bring back species whose survival is threatened, like the buffalo. We know that we can clean up pollution, even a river as polluted as the Thames. Quoting this guy Brooks from Conservation International, quote, it is even within our grasp to reverse climate change. Warning, warning, alert. But extinctions are irreversible. Jurassic Park is a fiction. Once a species is gone, it is lost forever. We have lost that half mil we have lost that million years of our planetary heritage for ever. And uh, thank you, you, you planet eater Thomas Friedman for defender uh, of, the, of the free market, how, uh, how it, it is the global free market taking down a planet. And if, and if Thomas Friedman thinks we're going to use the same global free market th that is destroying this planet to save this planet, Minnie Mouse has one thing to say to Thomas Friedman and any other techno-utopian thinking that uh, the green, these little greenies in the, in the global marketplace are, are, are going to pull off that stunt. And uh, with that, your old eco-hypocrite has to get in his gas-sucking truck one more time to get out there and get her done. And then it's time to pack up tomorrow and get out of here on Friday. So don't know how many more little dances you're going to get from Minnie Mouse. So what do you say, Minnie?